بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم سٹوڈنٹس ویلکم ٹو انٹروڈکشن ٹو لٹری کرٹیسزم دس اس کورس کوڈ ای این جی فور فائی فور اینڈ ویل سٹارٹ ود دا انٹروڈکشن آف لٹری کرٹیسزم مائی نیم از رابیہ شمیم اینڈ آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو ٹیچ یو لٹری کرٹیسزم دا فرسٹ تھنگ یو ہیو ٹو نو اباؤٹ لٹری کرٹیسزم از دیٹ آف کورس اٹس گوئنگ ٹو بی اباؤٹ لٹریچر اینڈ لٹریچر از آل اباؤٹ لائف So literary criticism is going to tell you how to appreciate it. Literary criticism, as the definition tells you, is the art of judging and commenting on the qualities and characters of literary works. What is a piece of literature telling you? Um, what kind of piece of work is it? Is it poetry? Is it good poetry? Is it bad poetry? Everything about a piece of literature is going to be evaluated because of the criticism. If you move with me, the purpose of literary criticism. Why would you criticize a piece of literature? What purpose does it serve you? Number one, it helps us solve a problem in reading. You're reading a piece of literature and there comes a problem. The people or the character in the novel or in the drama, they're portrayed in a sympathetic light. You see them as villains, but somehow the writer portrays them in the light uh, that he's trying to make you see them in a different light. He's trying to make you see them as uh, good people. Aap padhe hain, aap ko villains lag rahe hain. Lekin writer portray kar rahe hain, achche logon ki tarah. Aap kaise decide karenge ki ye kya hai, whether they're good people or they're bad people. Criticism is going to help you there. Criticism is going to tell you whether these people are good people or are they bad people. How, uh, for example, you have to know the history of the piece of work. Why, well, when was this piece of literature written? What was happening in the society at that time? And because of that thing happening, because of that particular political movement, or because of that particular social movement, or because of that particular feminist movement, the people who were writing this had a sympathetic feeling towards you. Now you are in another era. You are not feeling that sympathy on them. But those who wrote it, they felt that these people were in the right. They want to evoke your sympathy for these people. So the first purpose of literary criticism is to help you solve these problems, help you solve these dilemmas, these predicaments you find yourself in when you're trying to read a piece of literature. You can't decide whether this person is good or whether this person is bad. Why do we feel sympathy for him even if he's bad? Because the writer is very tricky. He is trying to make you feel good for the person who apparently is not very good. The second important purpose that literary criticism self is it helps you choose better of the two conflicting readings sound confusing i know it does but it means that for example you read a book there is a problem here for example you're reading lord of flies now the society is dissolved in it it's 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 resolved it, it's complete destruction in lord of flies why is there a complete destruction uh, whether the people were too much oppressed or there was a too little oppression. Should we have told them a lot about what to do or should it be a little less? The confusion is there, now. Just like we talk about children, do we need to teach them a lot? Do we need to teach them a lot? Do we need to teach them a lot? Or do we need to give them a lot? The same thing happened in the Lord of Flies. But there's a conflict between the readers. People who read Lord of Flies, they divide in different schools, in different groups. Half of them think that in Lord of the Flies, there was too much oppression. That's why the society was dissolved. Some of them think that in Lord of Flies, there was too little oppression. People should have been given a little more rules. Had they been given a little more rules, they would have been, you know, better off. But how do we decide? Formalists, formalist criticism will tell you how to decide. Because this is the criticism which is going to tell you what the writer was intending to write at that time. Number three. It enables us to form judgments about literature. What tells you what is good and what is bad? 
something has to tell you what is good and what is bad. There has to be certain rules, there has to be certain regulations, there has to be certain forms and there has to be certain categories that have that need to be in a piece of literature. जब वो चीजें पूरी होंगी तो ही आप कह सकेंगे कि हाँ, this is a good piece of literature. It should have this kind of language, it should have um, this kind of diction, it should have this kind of rhyme scheme, it should follow this particular uh, school of thought. Then and only then you will say that a piece of literature is good. Literary criticism is going to serve this purpose as well. Let me remind for you the three purposes literary criticism is going to serve for you. Number one, it will help you solve a problem in reading. Number two, it will help you choose between the two conflicts, conflicting arguments agar aayenge to. And it will help you form judgment about literature, whether a piece of literature is good or whether it's not. Okay, so how to go on about it? What are the different ways of criticizing a piece of literature? A criticism is very easy as far as we go in our society. It's very easy to criticize. We criticize people day in, day out. But when you're criticizing a piece of literature, it's known as critical appreciation of a piece of literature. So you have to follow certain rules. You have to follow certain ideas. You have to follow certain guidelines. The different theories, the different ways of critically appreciating a piece of literature. Let us go, uh, let us do it together one by one. Number one is the historical or biographical approach. As the name indicates, of course, that it deals with the history of the piece of work or the life of the author. Number two is moral or philosophical approach. Uh, it's a very old argument where people keep on saying that whether a piece of literature or a piece of art is for the sake of art, is it art for the sake of art or is it for the sake of teaching something, for the sake of moralizing, for giving out some philosophy. So literary criticism is going to, moral philosophical approach is going to tell you whether a particular piece of literature is following this function or not. Number three is mimetic approach. Mimetic approach, mimim, mimic kya hota hai? Mimic hota hai jo aapki nakal uta raha hai. Is the piece of literature an exact reflection of the society in it which it was written. Aapne kisi piece of literature ko parna hai, to aap mimetic approach ki zari ye decide karte hai ki is it the real reflection of the society in which it was written? Is it a mimic of that? Is it a clear imitation of the society in which it was written? If it was, then this approach is going to tell you, of course, you should like it. It's a good piece of literature. Then there is formalism, that is new criticism. These people, uh, they believe that literature mein koi bhi cheez bahir se nahi aani You should focus on literature in itself. The piece of literature that you're trying to appreciate or trying to critically appreciate for that matter should tell you within itself what it is. You should not borrow from the author's life, you should not borrow from the uh, times, you should not focus on the history, you should not focus on the morality, on the philosophy. You just focus on the piece of literature. Basically, forms are related, hota hai, structures are related. Hota hai, jo different types of, different types of uh, literary techniques hoti hai, unpe depend karta hai. That is how it's going to appreciate a piece of literature. Achha. Phir uske baad aati hai psychological approach. Um, very obviously, I'm, I'm saying it obviously because it's obvious to me and it's going to be obvious to you after some time. Psychological approach aapko batati hai ke what was going on in the mind of the writer when he was writing it, what is going on in the minds of the characters in a particular novel, they are, uh, or a particular drama, or a particular poem, the advantages, disadvantages of all these approaches. Most famous people here who have given us the theory of psychological and um, they are Freud and Carl Jung, they're very famous, we all know the names. We have mythological or archetypal symbolic approach. You have a particular set of symbols, which uh, Carl Jung believes is universal. And these symbols, they, are, they appeal equally to everyone. People, whoever read that symbol is going to be, uh, is going to identify with it immediately. They're going to get the meaning immediately. Feminist approach, as the name tells you, is about the literature written by or about women. Reader response criticism approach. This is another approach of criticism, literary criticism. It tells you 
that a piece of literature, whether it's good or bad, is going to depend on how the reader is going to interpret it. We have structuralism. Structuralism is like new criticism. It's going to tell you about the structure of the of uh, the piece of literature. It's going to appreciate it, it's going to criticize it on the basis of its structure. And we have deconstruction as well, and we're going to discuss it later on. Subse pehle hamare paas in detail when we're trying to study, uh, we have the historical and the biographical approach. I have told you that in order to understand a piece of literature, this approach, people who believe in this approach, or critics who believe in this approach, they believe that in order to understand a piece of literature, it is very important, very, very important to have the historical background um, of the writer and of the piece of work in which it was written. You cannot understand On His Blindness by John Milton unless and, under, unless and until you know that John Milton was blind. So you have to know about the author. There are certain things which cannot possibly be explained unless and until you know the era in which it was written. You have to know the king and the queen. You have to know the political movements. You have to know the social movements. You have to know the economic conditions of people written at that time, uh, people living at that time. You know how it goes that literature written after the First World War and before the Second World War, the literature written after the Jew. Uh, the Second World War, the literature written after the partition of Pakistan and India, all this literature has a great influence from, driven from, the drawn from the events in which it was written or the people who were affected by these events. All these writers who have gone through this partition or who have gone through genocide, all these people are greatly affected by it. And the literature written, hence, is greatly affected by it. So you cannot understand these pieces of literature unless and until you're familiar with the concept of the life of that writer. How, what did he go through, what happened to his parents. Anne Frank's diary, the diary of Anne Frank, it was a diary written by a little girl who was being haunted or who was being executed uh, by the Germans during the World War when the Jews were being killed off. You cannot fully appreciate what goes on in diary unless and until you know that in that time in Germany, what was happening with the Jews, what was happening And you cannot understand it unless and until you know what Hitler was aiming at. Why was he wiping or trying to wipe Jews off the face of the earth? Okay? Now, this is life and time, which is not only character, ka hai, uh, ek, sorry, author, ka hai, but also the character. Ka bhi if a writer is writing about, uh, let's say, the Victorian age, the characters, you have to, in order to understand the sensibilities of characters, you need to focus on the Victorian age. Victorian age, how did people live in the Victorian age? How did they live in the Victorian age? How did they live in the Victorian age? How did they live in the When you know their moral standards, when you know their way of life, only and only then you will be able to understand that piece of literature. You will be able to understand the conflicts in that piece of literature. And only and only then you will be able to decide whether this piece of literature is important or not, good or bad or whatever. But as in everything, there are advantages of this approach and there are disadvantages of this approach. Let's focus on the advantages first. This works well with works which are political in nature. Okay? If um, they, were, they were Puritans in England and the work written during that period of time had the political environment in it. So if you're familiar with the Puritans, if you're familiar with what was happening in that era of time, if you're familiar that there was a king who, gone, who, was gone mad, who, gone, uh, who went mad and uh, there was a king who, had, who was banished and then there was a king who was restored, you would be able to understand a little better about the poetry written during that era. If you knew that Milton went blind, then on his blindness is going to make, you know, is going to open a sea of meaning for you. It also works in order to place illusions in their proper context. There are certain things which do not make sense to us now. There are certain facts which we find extremely hilarious, but they were a big deal back then. Let's talk about the Elizabethan age, or we talk about the, um, let's say, Victorian age for that matter, or the Stuart century, or we talk about the Augustan age, or new classics, or whatever. These things, they mattered. So references of certain things that happened at that period of time, they were a big deal. 
and those references in those times were a big deal but not a big deal right now in order to understand those references Tories and Whigs and let's say Lysidas or let's say Puritans let's say Oliver Cromwell if you're not familiar with the age you will not be familiar you will not be easy uh, you will not be able to place the allusion in the right context अब इसके डिसएडवांटेजेस क्या हैं न्यू क्रिटिक्स से के आप हिस्टोरिकल बैकग्राउंड पर फोकस नहीं कर सकते दे बिलीव इन दिस वे यू आर गोइंग टू फोकस ऑन द इंटेंशनल फैलसी इंटेंशनल फैलसी क्या होती है इंटेंशनल फैलसी इज द इंटेंडेड मीनिंग ऑफ द राइटर वट एवर द राइटर इंटेंडेड टू से यू गोइंग टू फोकस ऑन दैट That's what the new critics say. He says they do not focus on the history. Focus on what the writer wanted to say. Focus on the intentional policy. What was intended. And of course, the second important thing, or second greatest disadvantage, or second greatest objection that is raised on the historical approach is that uh, you make it subjective. You make it relative. You do not make the piece of literature universal. When you are focusing on a period of time. on a certain century on a certain era or about a certain king or queen or about a certain author if you are appreciating literature from this point of view if you are criticizing a piece of literature from the point of view of time or history or background you are making it limited aap usko broader perspective mein nahi dekh rahe aap usko universally nahi dekh rahe balki aap usko ek era tak फोकस कर रहे हैं एक एरा में उसको कन्फाइन कर रहे हैं दिस इज द सेकेंड ग्रेटेस्ट डिसएडवांटेज दिस इज द अदर ऑब्जेक्शन दैट पीपल राइज ऑन दिस हिस्टोरिकल अप्रोच द नेक्स्ट अप्रोच वी शुड फोकस ऑन इज द मॉरल और द फिलोसॉफिकल अप्रोच दीज क्रिटिक्स दे डू नॉट बिलीव इन आर्ट फॉर द सेक ऑफ आर्ट द मेनी पीपल हु बिलीव दैट uh it's a major argument इन द लिटरी सर्कल्स दैट वेदर द आर्ट इज शुड बी फॉर द सेक ऑफ आर्ट यानी कि आर्ट का कोई मकसद नहीं होना चाहिए इट शुड बी ओनली अ थिंग ऑफ ब्यूटी अ थिंग ऑफ जॉय इट शुड ओनली बी देयर टू एंटरटेन बट पीपल हु बिलीव इन मॉरल और फिलोसॉफिकल क्रिटिकल अप्रोच दे से दैट अ पीस ऑफ लिटरेचर हैज टू हैव सम मीनिंग हैज टू हैव सम मोरालिटी टू इट हैज टू हैव सम फिलोसफी इफ दे डू नॉट हैव अ फिलोसफी व्हाट्स द पर्पज ऑफ पीस ऑफ लिटरेचर दे बिलीव दैट लिटरेचर शुड ऑलवेज इंस्ट्रक्ट लिटरेचर की बात हम इसलिए कर रहे हैं क्योंकि हमारा सब्जेक्ट लिटरेचर है वरना इनका कॉन्सेप्ट तो ये है कि आर्ट शुड बी देयर टू इंस्ट्रक्ट एनीथिंग एनीथिंग दैट इज आर्ट वेदर बी इट अ स्कल्पचर वेदर बी इट अ पेंटिंग इट कुड बी अ डांस इट कुड बी अ सॉन्ग इट कुड बी एनीथिंग शुड बी फॉर द सेक ऑफ इंस्ट्रक्शन इफ इट्स नॉट देन दे क्रिटिसाइज इट वी हैव एग्जाम्पल्स है फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू सी मैथ्यू ऑन मैथ्यू आर्नोल्ड ओके ही इज अ ग्रेट क्रिटिक ही सेज uh where is he here he says that poetry or piece of literature should have a purpose of high seriousness plato jisko hum aflatoon kehte hain literature must exhibit moralism and utilization it should not be without any utility they believed literature should have some sort of utility they believed ki literature ka koi fayda hona chahiye bagair fayde ke koi cheez nahi honi chahiye then we have another philosopher horace and horace horace believed that literature should be delightful and instructive he does not negate ke delight nahi honi chahiye he does not negate ke um, entertainment nahi honi chahiye but he says ke uske sath instruction bhi honi chahiye instruction ke bagair there is no purpose to literature so moral and philosophical approach we have already told you that these critics believe that the purpose of literature is to teach morality so if you focus on this many pieces of literature would be discarded immediately with these philosophers because uh, in old times most of the pieces of, of literature jaise bahut sari poems hoti thi like courtly love ki poems thi jaise bahut si pastoral elegies thi these things they didn't focus on you know morality they were there to entertain in the beginning of time in the beginning of history of literature the moral purpose was not of a big deal they were not there to teach literature was written for catharsis literature was written for morality it was not written for morality it was written for entertainment later on people said that it should be because plato from the beginning he said in poetics that uh, not poetics in defense of poetry he said that literature should not be written for uh, the sake of entertainment he was quite against poetry and all this stuff 
Advantages of moral philosophy would be, um, it's good, this philosophical approach would be good for works which have a moral philosophy. Like um, this Alexander Pope Nilikha on the essay on man may, that's good. He, he, he wrote for the sake of an instruction, he wrote for the sake of teaching people something. So it's good for these pieces of literature. And when you're considering the themes of the works, like whether it's teaching you uh, to be nice, whether there's a theme of good versus evil, in these cases, of course, you need morality. This approach would be good for those kind of works. It does not view literature as art only. It is is not isolated from all moral implications. So art for the sake of art, according to these people, would be destructive. According to the moral critics, art should be instructive. Now, what is philosophy ke disadvantages? Kya hai? They believe that this is judgmental. Why judge people? Why should people be good all the time? Why can't they be bad if they want to be bad? Why not be immoral? The present uh, f flow of society is going towards that way as well, don't you agree? That we believe that people uh, should not be, you can't judge people on being uh, immoral. You can't say that they're bad. They're immoral, they have flaws, let's ignore them. Why be judgmental? So this is how we're thinking like nowadays. We believe that don't be judgmental, don't judge people on the basis of their morality or their philosophy of life. We shouldn't. So the people who are against this approach or who criticize it or who raise objections say that this approach is a little too judgmental for their taste. Uh, secondly, literature is a piece of art. And if it's a piece of art, it should be judged on artistic merit. It should not be judged on the basis of, um, you know, what it is teaching you. Is it telling you how to pray? Is it telling you how to be good? Is it telling you how to be honest? They are like, not like, it's not like children's story that it should tell you to be honest, be truthful, be upright, be straightforward not to lie, not to cheat, not to fight. So they believe that art, piece of art, should be judged on the basis of its artistic merit and not on the basis of how moral it is, how good it is, what is it teaching you, what is the philosophy behind it. These people, they do not believe in it. Third thing, or the third critical approach is the mimetic approach. I have already told you once that mimetic approach is about imitation, imitation of life. Literature, when you started out to study literature, you must have heard it, uh, you know, said numbers of times that literature is an imitation of life. So mimetic approach says, if literature is an imitation of life and you want to appreciate a certain piece of literature, it should be an imitation of the life, of the life it, you know, claims that it represents. Mimetic critics ask how well the work of literature accords with the real world. Is it accurate? I mean, is it what really happens? Is it correct? Is it what is happening in the society? Is it correct? Is it wrong or is it right? Is it moral? Of course, they also believe in morality. They also say whether a particular piece of literature is moral. Is this something that society, that the society is, you know, accepting? Does it show how people really act? Is it, um, are the people too goody-goody in it? Or are the people a little, you know, black and white in the shades of gray? Mimetic approach include the moral criticism, uh, whether the people are moral or they're immoral, whether they should be like this or they should not be like this. It also applies psychological criticism, whether the stream of consciousness is going in the right direction or in the wrong direction. Or of course, the feminist criticism is also a part of it. Now we come to formalism or new criticism. Uh, they say that all the information that is necessary to interpret or to analyze a piece of work or a piece of literature should come from within the work itself. Whatever is written should be enough to analyze or should be analyzed accordingly. It should be all that is needed in order to analyze a piece of literature. Uh, all information essential to the interpretation of a work must be found within the work. There's no need to bring information from the outside about the author's life, about the author's history, politics of the time. 
completely outruling the historical approach, saying that there's no need to talk about the history, there's no need to talk about the author, there's no need to talk about the political times, there's no need to talk about the social changes happening in that period of time. There's no need whatsoever. They believe that what you have literature ka piece aaya hai, usi ko analyze karein. Usme words kaise use hue mein hai, usme kis tarah ke symbols use hue mein hai, usme kis tarah ki collocation hai, kis tarah ki eloquence hai, uske words kaise hai. Uska structure kya hai, usme kis tarah agar koi piece of poetry hai, to uski rhyme scheme kaise hai, uska meter kaise hai. Focus on that. Do not bring information from the outside. It is not interested in the piece of literature's effect on the reader. Do not focus on the reader. Reader is not your concern. As far as these people go, they say that reader is not your concern, whatever the reader might think, whatever is his interpretation, or whatever is the effect of this piece of literature on the reader is none of your concern. Do not focus on that. This particular aspect should not influence whatever you think about this piece of literature or how you appreciate it critically. You're talking about formalism here. It does not observe a piece of literature through the lens of feminism, psychology and mythology. Har cheez ko ignore karte hain, sirf literature pe focus karte hain, wo uski form pe focus karte hain, uski allergies pe focus karte hain. They do not focus on the psychology of the characters. They do not focus whether there's a particular, uh, there's a particular feministic movement going on in it, whether the women are being given right or they're not, whatever. They do not focus on that. They do not focus on the mythological illusions and references only going to focus on what is in the piece of literature. The formalistic critic would study the irony, whether there's an irony. Irony, I hope you know what is irony. Irony is the satire, the contrast. There's a paradox, the two things are together. Imagery, is there an imagery here? Is there a metaphor? Is the, what, what is the setting like? How, where it is placed? Is the setting, you know, is the setting telling you something about the themes of the, of the piece of literature? Is the paradox telling you something, something that is going on between the characters? Is there a metaphor? Is the metaphor significant? Characters, what kind of characters are they? Are they round characters? Are they flat characters? What, what are the interactions? How do they interact with each other? Do they face each other? Do they turn away from each other? All these kinds of things, these small idiosyncrasies of the characters, the way they sit on the stage or the way the directions are written, of course, or the way the characters interact with each other, all these things are going to tell you about that piece of literature. These are the things you should focus when you are appreciating a piece of literature on the basis of formalism or the new criticism as they call it. They're going to focus on the symbols. What does the flower stand for? What does the color green stand for? What does the mountain stand for? Whether certain things stand for death, whether the certain things stand for um, life, whether certain things stand for passion, colors, the mountains, the seas, all these things, all these symbols, they're going to try and interpret them. And of course, the point of view. From which point of view the novel is going on? Narrator kaun hai? Kaun story suna raha hai? Kiske kaun se reference se aari hai aapke paas story? Ye cheez ne bhi bhoat important hai. To formalist critic in cheezon pe focus karega. Jo ki practically iski form se related hai. Jis ta words usme use hume hai. Kya usme irony hai? Kya usme similes hai? Kya usme metaphor hai? Kya usme paradoxes hai? Is there any kind of, you know, symbolic importance of the things used? What kind of characters are there? What kind of relationships do they have? Uh, what about the settings and the point of views and the symbols? The formalist critic is going to focus on these things and these things only. The formalist critic is also going to think the certain things they focus on. First thing they focus on is the tension because वो बाहर से कुछ नहीं ला रहे होते हैं ना तो उन्हें जो कुछ भी लेना है उन्हें literature के अंदर से ही लेना है जब उन्हें literature के अंदर से कोई चीज लेनी होती है तो उसमें फिर ये है कि they have to focus on a lot of things and they have to invent a few things as well तो जैसे सबसे पहली चीज होती है जिसमें जिसपे वो focus करते हैं वो है tension अब tension क्या चीज है Tension is that the two opposite ideas, they're brought together in a poem or in a piece of literature and then they resolve. Two opposite ideas aate hain, wo ek dusse se takraate hain, aur phir wo ya to aap isa mil jate hain, ya milte nahi hai, to ek dusse ko tabah kar jate hain. That's the tension. Intentional fallacy, I've already explained it once, but I'll tell you again, that intentional fallacy is the intended meaning, whatever the writer intended to say. Affective fallacy is what is 
the effect it would have on a certain reader. These are the one of the things that the formalist critic or the new critic is going to focus on. He's also going to focus on the external form, all the metaphors and the similes and, the, and these things, paradoxes, all these things are the external forms of the literature, piece of literature, poem or novel. Usme kitne acts hain kisi play mein, uske acts ke kitne scenes hain, un scenes ki kya significance hai, kaun sa character kis stage pe exit hota hai, kis stage pe enter hota hai, uske enter hote hai, kaun si baat chal rahi hai, that is important. And he's of course going to focus on the objective correlative. The objective correlative is that these people they believe that there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a collection, there's a set of symbols, there's a set of objects, there's a set of um, things, places. And these things and places, this was, uh, they, they give rise to certain emotions in people. T.S. Eliot started this, objective correlative, and he believed that certain things rise, give rise to certain kind of emotions in a person. So they also focus on these things. This kind of literature, literary appreciation, is going to make literature timeless. How? Because you're not focusing on history, you're not focusing on morality, because you know morality is sometimes something that is moral once, may not be moral then again. Kuch cheezen thi jo kisi zamane mein unacceptable thi, but now they're acceptable. So it makes it universal. It makes literature universal. Things that have been immoral once are now moral. So if you're not going to focus on the morality, if you're not going to focus on the way the world is, if you're not going to focus on the history and the society, or the autobiography of the writer for that matter, then the literature is going to be timeless. It's going to be universal. Uh, this can be done without much research. You do not need to know a lot about the history of the piece of literature. You do not need to know about the writer much. You do not need to need, uh, know about a few philosophies. You do not need to know about the psychology. You do not need to know about um, uh, the society of that time, of course. So this helps you, this approach. This is going to be very easy. It could be started anytime without much research. And all the research is, whatever is the way you are trying to appreciate a piece of literature, it, they all start at this point. Kisi bhi piece of literature ko appreciate karne se pehle, aapko ye sara kuch karna padta hai. Ye sari cheezen aapne batani hoti hain. Chahe aap historical approach le rahe hain, aap mimetic approach le rahe hain, aap morality wali approach le rahe hain. Koi bhi approach lenge, to aapne form ko to discuss karna hi hai. To formalistic or new critical approach to hai na, this is the beginning of every kind of critical appreciation. What are the disadvantages? The biggest disadvantage is that you have to isolate the text. Kar dete. You are not focusing on anything other than the text. You are only focusing on the words. So this is an isolation. So it does make things a little difficult because there are certain references which you cannot understand unless and until you have the background, unless and until you have the context. If you don't have context, or if you have background, so it just becomes a collection of rhetorical devices, similes, metaphors, paradoxes, ironies. Okay, you have pointed them out, you have collected them, but you do not know in which context to place them. So this is one of the disadvantages of um, uh, this formalistic or new, critic, new critical approach. Okay, then we come to the psychological approach. This is very interesting, and especially for the students of psychology who have studied psychology for some time in their, you know, graduation or something. They must be familiar with the names of um, Sigmund Freud and uh, Carl Jung. They're very famous. So the critics who focus on the psychological approach, they focus on the psychological train. Whatever is happening in the minds of the reader, also in the minds of the character or what is happening in the mind of the author. As you can see in the slide, critics look at the psychological motivation of the characters or the author, although the former one is considered a more valid approach. Because you're focusing on the character here, author ke dimaag mein kya chal raha tha, aapko nahi pata. Lekin character ke dimaag mein jo ho raha hai, jo wo soch raha hai, jo wo soch ki basis pe action kar raha hai, wo aapke saamne hai. So it's better to focus on the psychological train of thought 
that the character is following. But in most of the cases, or in some of the cases, as it depends on the person who is critically appreciating a piece of literature, wo author ki psychological state ko bhi consider karte hain. Because you know sometimes there are certain traumas in your life and these traumas, they instigate you to write certain things. So when you write a certain thing, um, you are of course psychologically influenced. To us cheez ko jab koi appreciate karega, to wo uska psychological influence bhi leke aayega. Achha. Is silsile mein ji, sab se pehle naam aata hai, Freudian approach hai. Jo Sigmund Freud ko follow karte hain log. Ab na Sigmund Freud, um, is famous for his all the sexual references that he has in his theories. You know that. So he believes that a character ka three parts hoenge. A character would have an id, he would have an ego, and he would have a super ego. So all these things, there is a, there's a conflict between id and ego, and of course the super ego is trying to do something else in between. And all these three things are going to influence the character's actions, whatever he's thinking or whatever he's doing. He discussed the sexual implications of the symbols or the allegories that are the imageries that are used by a writer. If a writer uses a certain kind of image, he means this. So, jo log psychologically critical uh, appreciation karenge, psychological approach say, they're going to focus on the symbols and the implication that symbol has. For example, Freud believes that kuch symbols jo hote hain, they have female. Um, connotations. For example, anything that is concave, uh, like a flower or a pond or a glass or a bowl, they would be female, right? He believes that these images are female images. They have female connotations. They refer to a female. Something that is, you know, a little longer and less wider, that would be philic images. The philic images, they are related to men. He uh, focuses on Oedipus complex, and Oedipus complex is quite, you know, apparent in many pieces of the literature. Oedipus complex is like a child trying to get the attention of the mother and having a rivalry with the father. Certain pieces of literature would also focus on uh, the stages of development, child's stages of development, like oral, anal, and genital. So these people who believe in the psychological approach, they try to analyze a piece of literature on the basis of these things, these information, pieces of information that Freud has given you, that a person has an id, an ego, and a super ego. And they are also going to try and decipher the codes given in the writing, uh, whether there are certain images, certain symbols given. Do they have a sexual connotation? Does it imply something else other than that is obvious? They are also going to try and decipher if there is certain Oedipus complex or a lecture complex for that matter going on. As Freud believes that girls have a fancy for the father. And also, of course, they are going to try and discuss the child development stages. Jung, Carl Jung, he says, he believes in archetypal uh, criticism. Archetypal means the certain types, the certain collections, there are certain groups of things. He believes that psychological, psychological critics uh, who believe in Carl Jung, they say that there's a process of individualization. Self in a literature would include shadow, it would include persona, and it would include anima. Shadow would be the villain, the negative character. Persona would be the hero or the social self. And anima would be the heroine or the soul image. So anyone who's following this school of thought would search for these characteristics in a character, in a piece of literature. Of course, this is important or this is helpful when you're trying to understand characters that have certain psychological issues. If there is a character who's psychologically disturbed, like in The Caretaker, you have these two characters, Aston and Davies. Now, if you need to understand what is going on in the mind of Aston, you need to know the psychological stream of consciousness that he's going through. Whatever happened to him, what trauma did he underwent? In order to understand that, you have to focus on either the Freudian theory or the Jungian theory. Was there a process of individualization going on? Which character is the anima? Which character is the shadow? You have to focus on that. This helps when there is a psychological process going on in the character, in a piece of literature. It also helps about what the writer 
was going through, what was his psychology. It gives you an insight into the writer's psychology. It helps you to interpret because you know what the writer is going through. It will be easier for you to understand what he wanted you to understand and it will be a little easier for you to understand or interpret that particular piece of literature if you have an insight into the writer or the character's psychology. Its disadvantage kya hoga? A work of art can become easily become a piece of, uh, you know, a case of psychology. Ab, uh, psychology ka, yani ke ek clinical study ban sakti hai wo. This is not your purpose. You wanted to analyze a piece of literature on the basis of its literary merits. Psychology should help, should add to it, but it should not become a piece of clinical psychology. Second, it tends to see sex in everything. It overlooks it overlooks the other artistic merits it has. If you're following the Freudian approach, of course, the, every kind of symbol has a sexual connotation. So this would, you know, exaggerate it a little. So it's better to avoid it in this context at least. And some works do not tend readily to this approach because not everything is, you know, have a psychological undertone. Not everything is complicated. Sometimes human beings tend to be simple beings as well. They tend to say whatever they're thinking. It is not necessary that every piece of literature should have a symbolic meaning. It is not necessary that every piece of literature should have a double meaning. It is not necessary that every l character utters a line that has a different sexual connotation. And it is not also necessary that every boy has a fascination for the mother and also goes for the girl, that she has a fascination for the father. Okay, let's come to the next one. This is the mythological approach. As the name indicates, it has to refer to certain illusions. It has to refer to certain references, certain types. This approach says that there's a collection of symbols, images, characters, and motives that work the same response in all people because Jung believes in collective unconscious. What I wanted to say here is that there are some things that in every person have a special response. If you look at the red color, in every person has a special response. If you look at the green color, in every person has a special response. In the desert, in every person has a special response. Literature may in these on kelly these things, these particular colours or these particular things, they have a particular meaning. Why? Because Jong believes that we all have universal consciousness. Um sub ek bade zib ek bade consciousness ka his sign. So all of us react the same way to these symbols. For example, most critics they believe that death would be or could be represented by deserts. Deserts could also represent hopelessness. Deserts could also represent infertility. Uh, for example, red. The color red could, uh, in, could represent blood. It could represent passion. It could represent sacrifice. Green color is going to stand for fertility. It's going to stand for growth. These symbols, these, these critics, they believe that these symbols, they are universal. And people refer to them and they understand them readily. There is no need to explain them because people can easily understand what is going on here. Water ka symbol aayega to logon ko samaj aajegi ki it is referring to birth, it is referring to cleanliness, it is referring to rebirth, it is referring to growth. So these critics, they identify these patterns. Most of the people identify these patterns and they believe ki literature ki strength hai in, in, in patterns ke andar, in references ke andar, in objects ke andar, in symbols ke andar. Literature is all about these things. It makes it rich. This is the enriching formula that literature has. Of course, it makes it universal. Everywhere there is red mentioned, people will understand that we mean of course, they do understand, sometimes they don't, but universally, red is considered the color of passion, it's considered the color of danger, it's considered the color of sacrifice, it's considered the color of um, blood. So it becomes, it makes a piece of literature universal. Uh, and of course, it works well with the pieces of literature that are highly symbolic. Because uh, this was the new trend in the previous century and in this century as well. Things are not said out out. Magical realism ka jo hai concept usme yehi hai ki chizi aapke saamne black or white mein nahi rakhi jate hain. Balke aapko kuch symbols diya jate hain. And you are supposed to understand 
what these symbol mean you're supposed to decipher the code so this particular approach of lit of literary criticism is going to help you because it deals with those symbols its disadvantage kya hai ke isme aap symbols pe zyada focus karne lag jate hain and you ignore the art part of it you ignore the artistic merit of the work and you're going to zyada focus aapka un codes ko decipher karne pe hota hai you're trying to understand what a piece of what a particular symbol means and you're not going to focus on how well it is written because of course you know deciphering these symbols can be a very hard task and you focus on it and you continue to talk about it and all these things so this is the greatest disadvantage that this approach has that you are not going to f appreciate the artistic merit of a piece of work we go on to the feministic approach and the feministic approach is of course about feminism it's going to impact the gender and the impact that gender has on writing or reading for that matter what do women write and what do women like to read and does it affect it does it does the gender affect the writing or does the gender affect the reading is it different is the woman interpret literature differently or does she write literature differently is there an effect so this literary criticism is going to tell you how the gender is going to affect the reading and the writing it is about the literature that is written for women and about women um it begins uh, with the critique of patriarchal culture we are very much familiar with the patriarchal culture we know what a patriarchal culture is we know where the male is the dominant not only in the society but in the household as well in the single unit or broader sense maybe so it starts with that it always criticizes that and it is always political and it's always revisionist it means that they are going to question the standard norms the practiced norms the way things are done how certain political theories are accepted readily feministic critical approach is going to question that and they're going to do it differently they want it to be revised they want it to be rethought they want it to be done differently they say that gender determines everything or it doesn't at all it, what they want to say here is that your gender is either determining everything you do in life the way you talk the way you move or it doesn't at all so that's the choice of the reader how it's going to how's going to take it whether the gender is determining everything or the gender is not determining anything at all they argue that the male fears are portrayed in the female characters example iske main aapko de sakti hu there's a play in drama uh, the modern drama it's a doll's house and in a doll's house the husband has certain insecurities and he's going to project his insecurities onto his wife he doesn't want her to eat sweets he does not want her to act a certain way he doesn't want her to dress a certain way so these people believe that appreciate a piece of literature from this angle as well that there are certain male characters they have insecurities and these insecurities would be projected onto the female characters let's discuss it from this angle let's look at it from this angle whether certain male characters do this or they do not इसमें बहुत फेमस है थेरी आती है हमारे पास एलिन एलिन शो वॉल्टर्स थेरी शी इज शी इज एन अमेरिकन एंड शी इज द यू नो पाइनर ऑफ गायनो क्रिटिसिजम शी बिलीव दैट ऑल दीज सब कल्चर फेमनिज्म इज सब कल्चर ठीक है वी डू नॉट बिलीव इट टू बी द जनरल कल्चर ऑफ द सोसाइटी बट इट्स अ सब कल्चर शी बिलीव दैट इट गोज थ्रू फेजेज लिटरेचर गोज थ्रू फेजेज जो सब कल्चर होते हैं ना इनके डिफरेंट फेजेज आते हैं शी बिलीव कि ये जो कल्चर है जो फीमेल राइटर्स का कल्चर है इट गोज थ्रू थ्री फेजेज नंबर वन इज द फेमिन स्टेज फेमिन स्टेज में ये है कि यू are being the feminine you're accepting everything that is being given to you the role that has been given to you but you want to be on the equal level you're not challenging at this point of the stage point of time you're trying to be equal jaise um aap example le sakte hain ki jo women writers thi jane austen ke zamane ki jab male writers jo the zyada famous the aur unki books zyada padhi jati thi so all they wanted was to be accepted theek hai उन्होंने इस चीज को एक्सेप्ट कर लिया कि हाँ जी हम कमजोर हैं वी आर ए लिटिल यू नो 
under downtrodden and we would like to be on equal level as far as intellectual is concerned. Uh, George Elia, Jane Austen, these people, they took up the names of men but they wanted to be on equal intellectual level. This is the feminine stage. The next stage comes is the feminist stage, the protesting stage, when women thought that being equal was not enough, being accepted is not enough. They then challenged. They challenged the norms of the society. They wanted rights, rights to be autonomous, rights to vote, rights to property, all these kinds of things. Third stage that came is the female stage like you say the alpha male it's the alpha female stage when they wanted to be the point where the woman discovers herself discovers her identity it's the point where uh, she is autonomous where she's not needed where she's not where she does not need anyone else to define her she does not need a husband she does not need a father she does not need a son to define her she is herself enough for herself the process of self discovery ends here and she becomes the female here this is a turning inwards. This is a, this is a spiritual search that we, women go through from feminine to a female. Advantages kya hai is theory ke, is approach ke? Wo ye hai ke, aam taur pe jo female literature tha, it was a little underrepresented. So of course it, it was redressed here and of course it came to limelight and people started talking about literature written by women. Jane Austen became famous, the Bronte systems, uh, sisters, they became famous. And of course, uske baat to female writers ke line hai and they're very famous. They're very famous, they're very well read and they're very appreciated as well. But it's a disadvantage bhi hua ko. A disadvantage kya tha ke it is a little political. It does not, it's not any more confined to the pub. Literary, literary criticism. Okay, it becomes political because our feminism the feminism is a political theory here. It's a social political theory. Pirus me ye hota hai ki jo kuch aise kam which were written by men and they were very good, but because you were a feminist, you ignored those pieces of work. You did not want to talk about them. You said that because they ignored us, we are now going to ignore them. Third, you remove a women writer from the mainstream. Mainstream mein rengi, jahan pe orton aur admiyon ke literature ko ikatha treat kiya jai. But instead of doing that, you said the feminine literature is different. Assess us on being women. And assess us um, on being writing literature for women. So this is a disadvantage that you're not in the mainstream anymore. You have relegated yourself to a side. You have become separated from whatever the rest of the world is writing. So this is a disadvantage, of course. The next approach is the reader response criticism approach. The name suggested itself, there's no big mystery here, that reader response criticism is going to analyze the reader's response. When a particular person reads a particular piece of literature, what is his response? How is he going to understand it? How is he going to interpret it? And that interpretation is going to affect the literary quality, artistic merit of that particular piece of literature. Uh, in this case, these people, these literary critics who believe in this particular approach, they say that a piece of literature has no meaning whatsoever unless and until a reader has read that piece of literature. He is going to read it and he is the one, he or she for that matter, is the one who is going to give meaning to that particular piece of literature. They take into the account the strategies that the author has used in order to elicit a particular response in the reader. Authors they try to evoke certain responses. They write in such a way that certain particular responses are evoked. They want the readers to be angry at a particular state. They would write like that. And this critical approach is on techniques. It focus not reader on response, but it's going to focus on whatever the writer was writing, how he was writing it, and what was the purpose behind it. Intentional fallacy, we have talked about it. It denies the possibility that the work is universal. Of course, the work does not stay universal when you're focusing it or when you're depending on a particular individual. It becomes subjective because that individual is going to tell you what he thinks that piece of literature is. The next individual is going to tell you what he thinks what this piece of literature is. I am going to tell you what this piece of literature means. It differs from person to person. So it's not universal anymore.
course, this tells you, this is the biggest advantage to you, that you are a literary critic. You are going to tell what this piece of literature means, you are going to appreciate it, and you are going to analyze it. And you are going to analyze it differently than I will, or this person sitting next to us is. And people's interpretation, it changes over time. Things change, people change, times change, history changes, socio-political conditions change. Things that I liked when I was 21 years old are not the same anymore. I mean, I like different things. So things or pieces of poetry or share, which I won't like them now. My interpretation of those things would change because I've had more experience of life. So when you have more experience of life, your opinions about life, your interpretation of certain things, they change. What is the disadvantage of this interpretation? It subjective ho jayegi. It you will have to, you know, it would be confined, change from person to person. It would not be objective. You cannot, you know, vouch for it. You can't say that this is the interpretation of this piece of work. If for someone, red is the color of blood, of danger. For someone, it would be the color of passion. So it would become subjective. Kisi ke liye cheez positive reh jayegi, kisi ke liye cheez negative ho jayegi. Next is structuralism. It views literature as a system of signs. It's somewhat like a formalistic approach, and it tries to decipher the organizational codes, which they believe exist in all the literature. It is about modern literature, mostly. So let's see, deconstruction. Deconstructions, they make interpretation based on the political or social implication of language rather than examining an author's intention. This is basically on sociolinguistics, that you analyze the language of a piece of work. You know, lately what has happened is that literary criticism is on linguistic side. You try and focus on the language a little more. And you try and focus on the language and what the language is telling you about that piece of literature. You analyze the language and the themes. Ko thoda sa kam karte hai. And you focus on the social and the political aspect of that language. What does a particular um, word mean in this social context? What does this word mean in this political context? What does this particular word mean in this, um, you know, uh, socio-economic situation? So this piece of literature, this uh, type of literary criticism is going to focus on the language, the socio-linguistic element. So by the end, we come to the end of the literary theories. And now I'm going to give you a revision so that it's refreshed in your mind, whatever we started with. We started with the definition of literary criticism because we are, this is our course code. This is a course which we're going to study right now. So literary criticism is the art of judging and commenting on the qualities and the characters of literary work. There are different theories in it. But first of all, we should study what are the purposes. The purposes of literary criticism would be it will help you to make a decision whether a piece of literature is good or not. It is going to tell you uh, how to decide between two conflicting ideas existing in a piece of literature. And it will also help you solve a problem in a piece of literature. There are different approaches in the piece of literature uh, as far as literary criticism goes. The historical, there's um, moral, mimetic, formalistic, psychological, mythological, feministic approach, reader response criticism, structuralism, and deconstruction. Historical or biographical approach is going to focus on the history and the background of either the character or the author. It's going to focus on the life and the work and the socio-political condition or whatever was happening during the time period when the piece of literature was written, when that work was written, or whatever was happening in the life of the character in whichever era the, tri the writer is trying to portray. His key advantages kya hai? Ke it's going to work well when a certain piece of literature is political. But uh, it also helps you in you know, understanding certain references. But it will be difficult to apply this piece of literature because it's not going to make it universal. It's going to make it, you know, refined or confined to a particular period of time. And this approach tends to, you know, depend on the intentional fallacy, whatever the writer wanted to say. The moral or the philosophical approach, it says that you should appreciate a piece of literature 
on the point whether it is telling you something good, whether it's instructing you, or is it just the sake, art for the sake of art. Its advantages are that it is good for the pieces of literature which have a moral value, okay? which are not for the sake of entertainment only. Or this is also good when you're trying to study the theme of certain works. And it's not going to study literature as a piece of art only. It's going to study its other merits as well. This disadvantage is that some people believe that this is being judgmental. You're trying to judge a piece of literature. You're trying to judge whether something is good or evil. Because people believe that you should not judge people on the basis of morality or immorality. Literature should be judged only and only on the basis of its artistic merit. Pirate mimetic approach. Mimetic approach is the imitation of life. Is it correct? Is it accurate? Is it moral? Is it how people really act in daily life? Moral criticism is um, going to focus on a piece of literature through the lens of psychology or through the lens of feminism or through the lens of morality. Formalism or new criticism. It's going to focus on the form of the piece of literature. It believes in not drawing anything from the outside. It believes in not taking anything other than the text into consideration. Ye aapko focus karenge different things on page. Jaise uski, whether there has been any irony used, whether there has been any paradox, whether there are any similes, whether what's, what's the significance of the settings, what are the characters like, um, whether there are any symbols, what is the point of view of that particular piece of literature, who's narrating it, and what is the point of view of the person who's narrating it. There are certain terms that are used by the new critics, that's tension, intentional fallacy, pathetic fallacy, there's affective fallacy, external form, objective correlation. The advantages of this approach is that it makes literature timeless because you're focusing on the text only and you're removing the context. It can be done without much research because um, you know, you don't need to know any philosophy, you do not need, know, need to know the time period of the author or the character for that matter. And of course, all the kind of appreciation, every kind of literary criticism ki approach starts at this point. Because when you're trying to critically appreciate a piece of literature, you focus on the form first. This is the first thing you focus on. Its disadvantage is that you text ko isolate kar dete hain. And its other disadvantage is that you have to place allusions ko place karna possible. Nahi hai. References ko place karna possible. Nahi hota. It just becomes a collection of rhetorical devices. Psychological approach is that you have to focus on the psychological element of the character or the author. But most of the critics, they believe that you should focus on the psychological element in the character. This is why there are two schools of thought. One is the Freudian school of thought and the other is the Jungian school of thought. The Freudian school of thought believes that um, every character has an id, an ego and a superego. And whatever the character does is uh, whatever the character do is a conflict between these three parts of his brain, of his subconscious. They also believe, the Freudian critics, they believe that um, every symbol that has been used by the writer in a piece of literature should have certain connotations. And they believe in sexual connotations for that matter. Anything that is concave would be female. Anything that is phallic, that is a little longer and less wider, would be uh, male. They also believe in Oedipus complex, that is a man's fascination for his mother. They believe in Electra complex, that is the woman's fascination for her father. They also believe in assessing a piece of literature on the basis of Freudian theory of child development, that there are, third, there are three stages of child development, that's oral, anal, and genital. The Jungian approach believes in individualization. They believe that every individual has three parts, and these three parts are uh, the shadow, the persona, and the anima. The shadow is the villain, the negative character. The persona is the hero or the social self. And the anima is the soul, that is generally the heroine. Its advantage is that works where the characters are going through something psychological, it's, it's good there. You understand the character a little better. But um, 
it also tells you what the writer was thinking when he was writing it. When you have a psychological insight into the writer's mind, you understand immediately what the writer wanted to tell you in the first place. It's a disadvantage ye hai ki a piece of literature, piece of literature nahi reh jata. It becomes a case in clinical psychology. And some of the works, they are not ready, you're ready to be psychologically analyzed because some pieces of uh, literature are really pieces of literature. They're simple, they're obvious. They are not different shades of gray. And you tend to see sex in everything if you are applying the Freudian school of thought, which is, you know, overestimating things a little. The mythological or symbolic approach, they believe that there is a collective, there's a collection of symbols which is understood by our collective consciousness, as Jung puts it. They believe that everyone reacts to that kind of symbol in a particular kind of way, in a same kind of way, for that matter. Just like I example before, because everyone's going to react to red, everyone's going to react to desert, everyone is going to react to... Uh, the color green, desert is going to signify death, loneliness, emptiness, uh, infertility for that matter. Red is the color of passion, danger, blood, sacrifice. So they believe that literature is full of these symbols. And any piece of literature should be appreciated, should be criticized, it should be analyzed for these symbols. These symbols are going to tell you how rich a particular piece of literature is. And that is the best way to appreciate the piece of literature. These critics, they believe that. Its advantage is that it becomes, makes a piece of literature universal, of course, uh, because people do react to you know, symbols the same way all over the world. And it works with works that are highly symbolic. Jo modern literature is all symbolic. Hai na? Magical realism, wala, Gabriel Garcia Marcos ke novels, ho gaye, they're all highly symbolic. So it helps when you're trying to appreciate those pieces of literature. This disadvantage is that you ignore the art type of it, the art aspect of it. You're focusing on the symbols only. Feministic approach. It focuses on the literature written by the women for the women. It also focuses how a certain piece of literature, it is read by women. What effect does it have on women? It also tells you how to criticize a patriarchal society because it always starts with the critical appreciation of the patriarchal society, how men subjugate women, how men violate women. It's often political, it's often revolutionist, and you have to focus on the three stages of women development, or the three stages of development of women literature, female literature. The first point is that when or the piece of literature is feminine, when you're trying to be on the equal level, when you're accepting the role that has been given to you by the society, you're accepting it. Okay? You're accepting it, trying to assert yourself, but you're accepting whatever they're telling you that you are. Then comes the role of the feminist, when you struggle, when you protest, when you try to stand for your right. And the third phase is the kind of literature where, which is the complete female you know, the alpha female, where she has discovered herself, where she's autonomous, where she is, you know, all cool and she knows what she is. This advantage is that the female literature, it was a little, you know, underrated. It was downtrodden. So it makes it this kind of criticism, this kind of approach would bring it to the mainstream. The disadvantage is that it's a little political. It, you know, becomes warlike sometimes. And its other disadvantage is that you are going to make women writers separate from the mainstream. You're going to create a little brook for them. They are not the mainstream anymore. It ignores other merits. It ignores works that have been written by men. You ignore them because you hate them and you fight with them. Reader response criticism, as the name suggests, it depends upon the response of the reader. What the reader thinks of it, what meaning does it, he or she derive from that piece of literature, that is going to be the meaning of it. Its advantage is that people read differently. People read a piece of literature differently and they're going to interpret it differently. And um, it changes over time. Its disadvantage is that it makes the interpretation a little too subjective. The other two critical approaches are the structuralism and deconstruction. So here we come to the end of the lecture and we're going to start with
plateau next time we meet. We're going to discuss what plateau thinks of poetry and uh, how is he going to make fun of poetry for that matter.